Uh, this is Carrie Graff. I'm in Family and Lifestyle Medicine here at Rochester Regional Health, and we're going to be starting in just a minute. We're just going to wait for everybody to come on in. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Carrie Graff. I'm in Family and Lifestyle Medicine here at Rochester Regional Health, and I am going to be hosting uh, Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, I am really excited to be introducing our speaker, but before I do that, let me just remind you that you can ask questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're going to allow 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation today to uh, make sure we answer your most pressing questions. So our speaker today grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, where he descends from a long line of cattle ranchers. But rather than going into the family business, he got a medical degree from George Washington University in Washington, DC. And then he went on to do his residency in psychiatry at the same institution. He had a brief stint up at St. Vincent's in New York doing clinical psychiatry, but realized that his real passion was really in preventive medicine rather than clinical psychiatry. And he returned to Washington, D.C. in 1985 and founded the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, or PCRM, to research and promote health through diet. And he remains its president to this day. Over the past 35 years, PCRM has worked in various ways to further public health and to hold the medical community to the highest ethical standards. The decades of research done at PCRM has shown that a whole food, plant-based diet can reverse numerous lifestyle-related diseases. PCRM, PCRM has also been instrumental in affecting public policy changes to advance healthier eating. He may look mild-mannered, but he is fearless. This guy sued the USDA with a recommendation to include dairy in their food guidelines, and he won when six out of the 11 people making the recommendations were shown to have taken a large amount of money from the dairy industry. In 2016, he started the Barnard Clinic which integrates nutrition into a primary care medical practice so that they can actually reverse chronic lifestyle related diseases. And that is as, as accessible to patients as the pills that we normally prescribe that just treat the symptoms. He is the author of 20 books, hundreds of articles. Many of his books have been bestsellers and have sold millions of copies. An internationally known expert on plant-based diets. He's a sought out speaker and TV guest. Despite his fame, he remains exceedingly kind, generous, and humble. And here today to talk to us about how food affects our hormones and to give us a taste of his 20th book, Your Body in Balance, is Dr. Neil Barnard. Well, thank you, Dr. Graff. That's the nicest introduction I ever got. Uh, and uh, let me also say thank you to you for the work that you do in Rochester. I've been familiar with it uh, for quite some time. And having visited there and, and seen what you do, it's so impressive, I have to say. And um, I only wish that uh, the work that you were done, uh, that you have done and, and are continuing to do was around back when I was in medical school because it sure would have made everybody's lives a whole lot easier and it would have made our patients healthier. So thank you for all that you and your team are doing. Um, today, I wanna to talk about hormones. Uh, I'm gonna talk about insulin and estrogens and other things that work a lot of mischief in the body and the fact that we can control them to a large degree by food choices. And so if you don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen and walk you through some things that I'm hoping you'll be able to use in your clinical practice. Okay, give me a thumbs up. Do we have that okay? Can you see it? Okay, great. Um, I'm calling it the Nutrition Hormone Interface and I wanna start with diabetes. Uh, when I was uh, in medical school, I have to say, I thought diabetes was the most ungratifying thing to ever treat because nobody got better. Uh, you were just monitoring labs and trying to slow the descent into various complications. Well, it has become not just a pandemic worldwide, I'm talking about the diabetes pandemic, but when the infectious disease pandemic of COVID-19 spread, it meant that diabetes could kill you not in 40 years 
but in two weeks time. Um, so when the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic emerged in China, uh, the data were really, really troubling. There was a good review of more than 7,000 COVID cases. Those who didn't have diabetes had a mortality of 2.7%, those who had it, a mortality of 7.8%. So diabetes was somehow a killer if, for people who have COVID-19. But then if you looked at people within the diabetic group, those in poor control had an 11% mortality. Those in really good control had about a 1% mortality. However, were they really in such great control? Here's the difference. A1C of 8.1% was poor control, 7.3% in good control. Here's the point. Diabetes is a killer over the long run. Due to cardiovascular disease over the short run, it can make COVID-19 much worse. To get from poor control to good control is really not that challenging to do. You can do it with medication. But I'm going to argue that we should make sure that diet is, a, is, is where we start. Uh, and the reason for that, we've known from a long time that diet affects many aspects of health. The Adventist Health Study was an observational study. And they put Seventh-day Adventists under the microscope. And, and researchers have actually been doing this for decades for a simple scientific reason. You've got a very large cohesive group of teetotaling non-smokers, uh, health conscious people who happen to vary in diet, giving you a good basis for comparing different dietary patterns. And the American Diabetes Association published these data back in 2009, looking at body mass index. And as you know, BMI is effectively your weight adjusted for how tall you are, and a healthy BMI is below 25, we're gonna say. So uh, in the Adventist population, uh, the red bar here is non-vegetarians. Uh, Non-vegetarians meaning omnivores, people on my Fargo, North Dakota diet. They were not on average within the healthy BMI range. They were at 28.8. Uh, then semi-vegetarians, that's meat less than once a week, a little skinnier, 27.3. Pesco-vegetarian, that means fish, no other meat. They were marginally thinner. A lacto-ovo vegetarians, a little thinner. But look at the vegan group on, on the right. Now, if you're, if you're new to this, a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas. This is simply a person who avoids all animal products. And they are the only group that's actually, on average, in the healthy range. But the reason that the ADA published it was not because of weight. It was because of this, diabetes. The diabetes prevalence, dramatically lower the more you get the animal products off your plate. So there was something about this plant-based diet that made not only weight problems less likely, but diabetes less likely. So uh, after a number of preliminary trials of our own, the NIH funded us to do a randomized controlled trial of a plant-based diet for type two diabetes. And the question was, in people with type two diabetes in a controlled setting, would a plant-based diet actually look good compared to a conventional diet? Uh, the citations you see are at the bottom. The initial results were uh, presented in Diabetes Care in 2006, and the longer term uh, results were in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2009. Just to walk you through uh, what the intervention was. The conventional diet was what you get in many clinics in the past and to some extent today if you had type 2 diabetes. Limit calories, keep carbohydrates fairly steady, and limit bad fats. I'm talking about trans fats and especially saturated fat. For the plant-based intervention, we eliminated animal products completely. It was a vegan diet. Oils were minimized and we favored low glycemic index foods. What that means is um, white bread, for example, raises your blood sugar fairly rapidly. It's high glycemic index. Rye bread is more gentle on your blood sugar. It's lower glycemic index, uh, pumpernickel even lower. So uh, sugar is high glycemic index, beans are low glycemic index. It's just a question of how rapidly the carbohydrates they contain are digested. And we favor the, the slow ones, but this is not a low carbohydrate diet at all. It's fairly high carbohydrate because you're eating beans and vegetables and fruits and grains and so forth. Okay, so to cut to the chase, uh, we we're tracking hemoglobin A1C. Our patients were not at seven to start at baseline. Uh, the red line shows individuals who are on the uh, conventional diet. They improved. Uh, they dropped their A1C about 0 0.4 absolute percentage points. That's good. We'll take it. However, the vegan group 
dropped by 1.2, a little bit more than that, 1.2 absolute percentage points, just on average. Uh, in other words, if, if going on a plant-based diet was like taking the best oral medication you could ever find, uh, actually a little bit better than that. Uh, Vance was one of our first <clears throat> research participants in this trial. And Vance told me what diabetes meant to him. He said he had it all up and down his family tree. It means you're gonna lose a leg, go blind. Vance's father was dead at age 30. Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed with, with uh, type two diabetes. And he came in to see us in his late 30s. Uh, he went on the plant-based diet. After a year, he had lost 60 pounds. And in the course of doing this, he said something that I thought was really important. Um, he was contrasting the diet with previous diets because many people think of a vegan diet as demanding, like you have to acquire a taste for folk music, <laughs> wear tie-dyed clothes or something. He said, no, 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 vegan diet is so simple. Prior diabetes diets that he had done before required him to cut calories. So if you eat 2000 calories a day, well now your menu adds up to only 1500 and you go to, you go to bed hungry every day. That only lasts until about Wednesday and then you start giving up on the diet. And he had to count carb grams and all this stuff. On the vegan diet, he didn't have to do any of that and he appreciated it. He said, the rules are simple. You don't have meat chili, you have bean chili. You don't put Alfredo sauce on your pasta, you put tomato sauce. It, Anybody can do it. It's really simple and you can eat as much as you want. Uh, he's, his doctor, his private doctor, stopped his diabetes medications. And his A1C was nine and a half to start, but it fell to 5.3. <laughs> and I wanna tell you, when I got his lab slip, um, I closed my office door and I paced around in my office for about 10 minutes trying to decide, could I tell Vance he doesn't have diabetes anymore? And it, this, this was uh, 16, 15, 16 years ago. And at that time, everyone said, once you've got diabetes, you'll always have diabetes. And, and it was quite controversial to have diabetes go away. And of course, now we see it all the time. And we've become quite used to the fact that diabetes is a state you can get into. You can also get out of it. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, Velveeta is waiting right around the corner. And it's uh, unfortunately very easy to get diabetes back if you had it in the past. So, uh, by the way, I asked his permission to share his uh, experience with you, and he said, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away too. Um, that's what happens when the arteries open, open up again, but that's another story. Okay, and now I'd like to talk to you about your car insurance. Um, Geico has its, uh, okay, just kidding. Geico's national headquarters is about three blocks from my office, and back in the, uh, uh, oh, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, they asked us to do a, a randomized trial at Geico. And the idea was they had 2,500 2, people there. Many of them had diabetes. Many of them had weight problems. So we brought in individuals and randomly assigned them to either no intervention or to a plant-based intervention that was uh, done in the cafeteria where alongside the double bacon cheeseburgers, they had veggie burgers. And uh, alongside the bacon and eggs, they had an oatmeal bar. So they had vegan choices. And once a week, the employees got a, um, a, a class if they wanted to come about how to do a completely plant-based diet. And for the cafeteria manager, this was a little bit new. There were a few missteps along the way. <laughs> they had to realize that maybe the bacon and cheese shouldn't be on the vegan burger. Um, however, the participants who were in the intervention group lost weight very nicely um, and their hemoglobin A1Cs fell. Uh, we repeated this trial, by the way, in 10 different cities, Macon, Georgia, Dallas, Texas, Buffalo, New York, San Diego, many others, to show that you don't have to be in just, say, the East Coast to make it work. Uh, this can work anywhere. Uh, and we had tremendous results in the participants at GEICO, uh, really feeling energetic and feeling in, in control of their diets. Uh, here's Hillary and Bruce. Hillary's lost 85 pounds. Bruce, is lo Bruce has lost 100 pounds. Okay, uh, this is a meta-analysis of all the studies done up till 2014 using plant-based diets to reduce A1C. And if you're not familiar with forest plots, uh, you want to, each study is a line and on each line on the right-hand side, you see a little black square. If it's to the left of that center line, that means A1C fell. And as you can see, A1C fell in every study. Uh, it's a very predictable effect. If you bring in a, a group of people with type 2 diabetes, they improve. So the regimen that we 
prescribe is illustrated in this power plate, fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. Legumes are beans, peas, and lentils, plus taking vitamin B12. Uh, and, and let me now demonstrate why this works. And this is my most important slide. So if you're texting or doing something else, let me ask you to, to watch what I'm gonna show you right now because I wanna describe how it is that a plant-based diet can help type two diabetes because it relates to the pathology of this, uh, of this disease. This is a cell. This purple oval could be a muscle cell and cells are powered by glucose in the same way as your car is powered by gasoline. But the glucose has to get in that cell. Right now it's outside and glucose cannot get into a muscle cell. It can't get into a liver cell. It just, it, it can't get through unless we have a key, which is insulin. And by the way, if you're having trouble seeing the full screen, you can minimize my photograph and the little photo strip you're seeing on the side so you can see the full diagram here. So the insulin key is made in the pancreas and it attaches to a receptor on the surface of the cell. As it does, it signals channels to go, or go to the surface of the cell and open to the entrance of insulin. So insulin allows the glucose to enter the cell. So what could ever go wrong? Well, what if my dinner looks like that and my lunch looks like that and my breakfast is like that and I'm eating fatty foods? Yeah, these foods have plenty of fat in them. And the fat that you eat can enter the cells of your body. So. Fat builds up in the muscle cells. It builds up in the liver cells. And as it builds up, that building, that, that buildup of fat interferes with it, it, insulin signaling. The buildup of fat causes insulin resistance. So now, oh, by the way, we, we refer to it as intramyocellular lipid in the muscle cells or uh, hepatocellular lipid in the uh, liver cells, but it causes insulin resistance. So the insulin key still attaches to the receptor normally, but nothing happens. The glucose cannot get into the cell. It just bounces off, okay? So what do I do? I go into an NIH funded research trial and suddenly the animal products are removed from my diet and the oils are minimized and the fat starts to dissipate from your cells. And when the fat is gone or diminished, the insulin key can work again. It can open up the little channels on the surface of the cell and in comes the glucose and everybody's happy. Okay, so here's the key. All of your patients are focused on carbohydrate and that is a mistake. Carbohydrate provides glucose, which is the natural fuel for your muscle cells and your liver cells and your brain. The problem is that the carbohydrate releasing the, the, the glucose, that glucose cannot get into the cell because they are filled with lipid. The lipid comes largely from diet. A diet exchange can stop that and your insulin sensitivity can return and diabetes can improve and go away. Patients understand this. You can draw, draw this diagram on an 8 by 11 sheet of paper, give it to your patients. They will understand it, they will put it to work and they will feel empowered. It's the most amazing thing. Uh, let me uh, take you to New, New Haven, Connecticut because I want to um, share with you a research study done by Kit Peterson and Jerry Shulman and their team. They brought in 26 healthy volunteers. They gave them a glucose tolerance test drinking you know, 75 grams of syrup. And some of the participants were insulin sensitive. Others were insulin resistant. They uh, tracked the demographics of these people. They were young, 28, 26. Uh, they were thin, uh, 132 pounds versus 141 pounds. They're, they're thin people. And do they have diabetes? No, they got low hemoglobin A1C. However, they then use a technique called MR spectroscopy. It's, you know, in a, you, you put them in a magnet and you, through MR spectroscopy, you can measure the lipid inside their cells. And here's what they showed. Every dot here is a person. And this is the intramyocellular lipid of each individual. The control subjects, the healthy subjects, had much less intramyocellular lipid compared to the insulin resistant subjects. And when you look at their mitochondria, they are much more active in the control subjects, the healthy subjects, less active in the people who are insulin resistant. What, what am I getting at? What I'm saying is that these are young, skinny, non-diabetic individuals who, if they are insulin resistant, they've already got the buildup of fat inside their muscle cells. They will not have diabetes for another 15 years or maybe 20 years, but the disease process has started. 
It's shutting down their mitochondrial activity. It's making their cells less active. It's making them less able to take glucose out of the blood. Their uh, insulin levels are rising. The disease process has begun. And 20 years, 15 years from now, they're going to be diagnosed with diabetes. And then they're going to be put on metformin and sulfonylureas and insulin. And nobody's going to talk to them about the fat in the cell that started this off. Once they understand what's happened inside their body, they have control, they can change it. Okay, I wanna shift gears. I wanna talk now about estrogens. We talked about insulin, the insulin hormone. I wanna to talk to you about estrogens. Uh, I got a call from this, this young woman a number of years ago. She said, Dr. Barnard, I am miserable. I said, well, what's, what's the problem? And she said, I'm being tortured. Uh, she had menstrual pain. Now, many women have some menstrual pain, but for some, it's off the scale, uh, maybe one day or two days every month, they're not going to work. Now, dysmenorrhea is very common. It can be primary dysmenorrhea uh, driven by prostaglandins. It can also be secondary to other conditions like endometriosis or adenomyosis, which is, uh, if you're familiar with these conditions, endometriosis means that cells lining the uterus have migrated, presumably out the fallopian tubes, and they're implanting all around the abdomen. Adenomyosis means those same cells are now implanting within the myometrial layer of uterus, or you can have, again, have fibroids. Um, and to diagnose this condition, you wanna look at the age of onset, you wanna look at the chronicity, you wanna look at the duration of symptoms, and you can do a pelvic exam or ultrasound or laparoscopy and so forth. That's uh, normal uh, workup. For this young woman, I said, let me give you some painkillers for a couple of days to get you through this. And she had already um, had her own, uh, own private gynecologist who could do all of these, uh, this other workup. And I suggested to her that she try something that I don't think any doctor had ever suggested before for a dysmenorrhea patient, which was no animal products for the next month and minimize oils. And let me be clear, none of this takes the place of a proper diagnosis and, pro and, and medical treatment for the patients who want that. But for patients who have had it and they're not getting to where they want to go, you might want to add one more thing. And that's this diet change. But at the time I made the suggestion to this patient, I don't think any doctor had ever suggested such a thing before. And I'll tell you in a minute why I suggested this. Uh, she called me back four weeks later. She said, Dr. Barnard, something remarkable has happened. My period has arrived and I had no pain whatsoever. And this next month and the next month and the next month is the same thing. She was cured unless she would change her diet by either uh, you, you could be introducing animal products or bringing oily, greasy foods back in, her pain would come back. So I thought that was intriguing. So we did a randomized clinical trial with our colleagues at Georgetown University. Um, we brought in a group of women who had dysmenorrhea. Half of them went on the diet, half of them took a supplement, which was in fact a placebo. After two cycles, two months, they switched. The diet group began the supplement, the supplement group began the diet. And in a nutshell, it worked. We published the findings in obstetrics and gynecology. And what we showed is that pain intensity and pain duration diminished, and so did uh, PMS symptoms. And let me just walk you through this really quickly. Looking as, the, as their periods approached, if you looked at the number of days of any kind of behavioral change, like moodiness or whatever, it dropped from 1.7 at, at baseline down to 1.1, okay? Then we looked at water retention dropped from 2.9 at the beginning to 1.3 days on the diet. So we got a sense that something physiological was happening in response to the diet. So then we looked at any, any days with pain once their periods began. And before the diet intervention, it was 3.9 days of pain, and this shrank down to 2.7 with the diet. But then we looked at diet in, or pain intensity. And each day they gave it a number. On day one, before the diet change, it was a seven. Day two, it was a five. Day three, it was a three. And then after the diet change, it was six, down to three, down to gone. So this is an average. For some women, it didn't work at all. For others, their pain was flat out gone. But this was, these were average changes in duration and intensity of pain. So what's going on here? What's going on is estrogen. In the same way that insulin, affects your cellular metabolism. Estrogen dictates reproductive changes. And at the beginning of a woman's cycle, there's very little estrogen in her blood. And I'm gonna use the generic 
uh, es word estrogen, uh, prior to menopause, it's estradiol for the most part. Uh, es estradiol levels rise over a two week period roughly, uh, then it peaks and then it falls rapidly. Uh, she is ovulating. And then over the next week or so, the amount of estrogen rises again. And this is because the uterus is the most optimistic organ in the body. Every month it is convinced pregnancy could occur. And so the rising estrogen level in the blood thickens the uterine lining to get it ready for pregnancy. A week later, the disappointed uterus discovers we are not pregnant once again, and the amount of estrogen descends and the uh, endometrial lining is discarded in menstrual flow. Let me show you this uh, pictorially. Um, this is the, the, the pink line, uh, lining there, that's the endometrium. And under the influence of estrogen, it thickens every month. This is normal. What if I have too much estrogen in my blood? Then that thickening will be too severe. It will release prostaglandins, which cause pain. So as the young woman was calling me on the phone, I thought, wait a minute. I'll bet you you've got too much in the way of prostaglandins produced by your endometrium. And we can change that with diet. So how do foods get hormones into better balance? Um, when I was talking to this young woman on the phone, I had the advantage of having read some research articles about hormone control, uh, not for dysmenorrhea, but for breast cancer. And I wanna just walk you through it really quickly. The take home messages are fiber reduces estrogens. So if you're eating uh, vegetables and beans and fruits and whole grains, you're getting fiber reduces estrogens. Fat increases estrogens. So if you're eating meat, cheese, or even fried foods or vegetable oils, estrogens will rise. How do we know that? Back in 1991 at the American Health Foundation, 62 women were brought in not to see what could be done for dysmenorrhea, but to see what you could do in a young woman to maybe reduce the estrogens that could later lead to breast cancer. And what they did is that they, they increased the fiber, roughly doubled it, and found that estradiol fell, estrone fell as well. Now, for some reason, this worked with wheat flour, but it didn't seem to work with oats or corn. I'm not sure quite why, but we're gonna come back to the fiber mechanism in a minute. Uh, UCLA, 1995, a smaller study, but now they did two things. They increased the fiber, but they reduced dietary fat. And they found a similar result. Estrone fell, estradiol fell. Then at Tufts, uh, 1994, they brought in 48 women, locked them into their metabolic ward, and gave them a whole series of dietary interventions, one after the other. Uh, it was a metabolic ward. They gave them isocaloric and weight-maintaining diets. And in some cases, they reduced the fat from 40% of energy down to 20 to 25, or increased the fiber from 12 to 40 grams, or did both. And it became very clear that reducing fat reduces estradiol, estrone, free estradiol, estrone sulfate. And increasing fiber has a similar effect that is independent of the effect of fat. Okay, so you can put these together with the plant-based diet. Uh, in San Diego, the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study uh, was all women who had previously been diagnosed with cancer used a high fiber, low fat diet, same story. Reductions in estradiol and bioavailable estradiol. So what are we learning? Um, we re if we reduce fat and increase fiber, we're gonna reduce our estrogen levels and that ought to help with dysmenorrhea. Um, let me make this pictorial. Uh, this is your liver, and your liver, as you know, pulls a lot of things out of the blood and sends them down the biliary tree into the intestinal tract. Estrogens, in some cases, go this route. Um, however, this depends on one thing. If there is no fiber in your diet because your lunch was chicken breast or salmon or yogurt, then there's not enough fiber in your digestive tract to hold the estrogens in your digestive tract and they end up being reabsorbed back into the blood. This is enterohepatic circulation. So women who are on low fiber diets, as most American women are, have higher circulating uh, estrogen levels. When you increase the fiber, you stop the enterohepatic circulation. The fiber is, is carrying the estrogens literally out. They flush them down the toilet. So just to make sure that we are clear, does spam have fiber? No, it is an animal product. 
So you have a trash can and there it goes. Um, KFC, the fiber in this meal is entirely in the carton that it's sold in. The rest has, is fiber free and that can go too. Now, now there are some foods that started out with fiber, but they were so processed in factories that the fiber is gone. And so we're gonna get rid of all of those things. Fiber interrupts endohepatic circulation of estrogens. Okay. Uh, also, when a person is on a low fat, high fiber diet, they lose weight as uh, we discussed earlier. And fat cells are estrogen factories. So as you remember from uh, physiology, testosterone can enter a fat cell and estradiol comes out. Uh, Androstenedione can enter the fat cell, estrone comes out. And so a fat cell will turn androgens to estrogens. If a woman reduces her body fat, she can reduce her estrogen level. That's good because it will reduce her risk of postmenopausal breast cancer, but it can also then help her with all the other mischief that estrogens can cause. So it helps to boost fiber, cut fat. And now we can see how in our Georgetown trial and with that young woman, how this dietary prescription would work uh, because it's a high fiber, very low fat diet. Is there anything else I can do? Maybe so. I want to share with you the story of Catherine. She grew up in Louisiana. She was in the Air Force. And in 2003, she was shipped over to Iraq. When you're in a war zone and you're working really hard and you're eating what the government gives you, you don't actually gain very much weight. And that was her situation. And as soon as her tour of duty was finished, she got shipped back home to the US and her friends took her out to eat. And they asked her, what did you miss while you were gone? And she missed cheese, cheese, macaroni and cheese, cheese snacks. And so she tucked into them in a big way. And a friend of hers actually gave her an entire case of macaroni and cheese dinners, 48 of them, which she ate for 48 days straight. I'm not making this up. And she developed weight gain, but she also developed endometriosis, which is, as you know, is a condition where the endometrial cells migrate uh, out, uh, presumably through the fallopian tubes, to implant around the abdomen. They attach to the intestines, to the other organs, they can attach to the fallopian tubes, they can attach to the ovaries, they can damage them and they cause pain and they cause infertility. Painkillers, hormonal treatments did not help her. She ended up having such severe pain that her doctor said, the only thing we got left is a hysterectomy. She didn't want to do it. She was 27. She and her husband hadn't yet had a family. But her doctor told her, you know, in all likelihood, the endometriosis has rendered you infertile anyway. She agreed to the hysterectomy. But in the six weeks before she could have the procedure, her, she saw a nutrition expert who told her about a diet change that was very much like the diet change that we had proven to work in our Georgetown trial. Get the animal products out of the diet, keeps oils really low, eat very simple plant-based foods. She did it. She started to feel good. She felt a lot better. Uh, she lost weight. Her pain diminished, but the pain was not 100% gone. There was a little residual pain there. So at six weeks, she showed up to the operating room and she was anesthetized for the hysterectomy. An hour later, she woke up to find her doctor shaking her shoulder saying, Catherine, I need to talk to you. We looked inside with a laparoscope. I was prepared to take out your uterus, but I didn't do it. Your endometriosis is gone. You did have some adhesions. We removed them. You had a lot of scarring, uh, but I think you're going to feel a whole lot better now. And we didn't have to do the hysterectomy. She uh, never had a hysterectomy. She lost a lot of weight. Um, she was not infertile after all. Um, she has three kids now, and she now teaches other women how to take back their health. Um, the, the, the point being, she had been eating foods that had caused weight gain and had hormonal effects. So what about that cheese that she loved so much? Does cheese have hormones? Well, cheese comes from milk, milk comes from cows. Cows are impregnated annually to increase their milk consumption. They are milked during much of their pregnancy. Traces of estradiol from the cow's milk will end up in cheese, they're concentrated in cheese. And although it's only a trace, it is more than enough to affect human biology. There is no such thing as hormone-free milk. 
all dairy products have estrogens in them. When you get the dairy products out of your diet, it does seem to have hormonal benefits. So the diet steps for dysmenorrhea, reduce the fat, increase the fiber, avoid dairy products. And to make this short and sweet, it's a low fat vegan diet, okay? It says proven benefit. All right, um, we have found though, that people who do it sort of halfway, I'm gonna do it Mediterranean style, it tends to not work. They do, these patients don't lose weight. They don't feel a lot better. And they think that, well, maybe it's all genetic. Give it a try. Use a 100% plant-based diet and see what happens. Uh, let me shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about fertility more broadly. Um, in the research study that I mentioned earlier about dysmenorrhea, one of the patients who thought that she was pregnant, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, who thought that she was infertile, became pregnant uh, two months into the diet. The reason that this happened was we asked all of the participants to not use any hormonal medications during the study because hormones would goof up a dysmenorrhea study. Um, so if they were sexually active, we said, please don't use the pill, use some other contraception. And one patient said, don't worry, I'm infertile. I, don't, I haven't used contraception for years. Second month on the, on the diet, got pregnant. What's this about? Well, there's lots of etiologies of infertility, diminished uh, ovarian reserve, ovulatory dysfunction. It can be tubal factors, uterine factors, and it can be the man. There are a lot of treatments for it as well. But let's shift gears, and I want to look at foods. Starting with weight. Those of you who, who deal with infertility, you have seen this, that w the sweet spot for fertility is with a BMI between about 18 and a half and maybe up to 22 or so. But when people are heavier, their infertility is much more frequent. And also when people are underweight, you can, have, you can lose ovarian activity. The sweet spot is within the normal range and even kind of on the thin edge of normal. But there's something more. The dairy sugar, lactose, is a disaccharide that is digested to galactose and glucose. And galactose has been investigated for its effect on fertility because it's long been known that it affects the ovaries. Uh, Dan Kramer at Brigham and Women's uh, in uh, Boston looked at changes in fertility across various countries. And what he was looking at was dairy consumption per capita, that's the x-axis, and changes in fertility, that's the y-axis. The change he's looking at is the drop off in fertility be uh, between a woman, say her late 20s, and her late 30s. During that interval in Thailand, fertility drops about 20, uh, maybe 25%, something like that. Milk is not a big part of the diet in Thailand. Brazil, milk products more consumed. Uh, the drop-off in fertility, about 50%. The United States, milk products are everywhere. The drop-off in fertility, about 80% in this interval. Same in New Zealand. And when you fill in the other countries, you see not a perfect pattern, but the Pearson's correlation is pretty strong that the more milk people, uh, the women are consuming, the more rapid their loss of fertility. And the thought is it could be galactose. And part of the reason that we thought that is that we had already seen a different kind of ovarian toxicity. That's ovarian cancer in Sweden. Those women consuming more dairy had a substantially higher risk of ovarian cancer. So what we believe is that it's not in this case, the hormones in the dairy, it could well be the milk sugar, and the milk sugar is the biggest, the main nutrient in milk products. Um, here is a forest plot looking at dairy consumption and ovarian cancer risk across a great deal of studies. If you're to the right of this line, that means that milk increases the risk, or dairy increases the risk of ovarian cancer. And as you can see, all but one of the studies uh, show that, uh, that relationship. Uh, I'm not going to talk about prostate cancer here, but we see the same effect with prostate cancer. So men uh, men consuming uh, dairy products regularly have a substantially higher risk of prostate cancer compared to other men in a great many uh, uh, observational trials. Let's talk about male fertility. Um, this, this was a study of men in a fertility clinic. Those who consumed a half a serving of cheese per day had higher sperm counts compared to those men consuming one to two and a half servings of cheese per day. So what researchers have started to speculate is that the traces of estrogens in cheese affect not just women, but affect men. They are only traces, but they're there. And infertility, endometriosis, and dysmenorrhea will not kill you. But breast cancer can. And estrogen molecules sneak through the cell membrane. They sneak through the nuclear membrane. They can attach to estrogen receptors and, and affix to your DNA causing a normal cell to become a cancer cell. 
And the more you have uh, estrogens in your blood, the higher your risk of postmenopausal cancer. Uh, I want to show you the results of nine prospective trials in postmenopausal women. And what we see is a, just a clear cut dose response relationship. This is not ingested estrogens. This is estrogens in, made in a woman's body. Now, of course, ingested estrogens will contribute to this, but the point being that hormones of every kind can kill you. Insulin can kill you. Um, if you don't have enough, if you have too much, estrogen, same story. You, you need to be in a balance. Same with thyroid hormone. You don't want to have too little, you don't want to have too much. Um, speaking of dairy and breast cancer, this is a brand new study that came out of the Adventist Health Study 2, and they looked at dairy products and breast cancer risk. And if you look along the x-axis, you see the amount of uh, milk consumption going from zero to a quarter cup a day, half cup a day, one cup, two cups, four cups. And as you can see, the amount of, or the risk of breast cancer goes way up, right along with dairy consumption. And the authors of this study said that the estrogen and progesterone levels in milk appear to be small. However, are they really biologically mm -hmm. unimportant? A changing from a no dairy to a dairy diet increases estrogen levels in South African black males. It increases urinary excretion and serum levels of estradiol. Milk consumption affects sperm mortality and morphology in young men. And dairy products can even delay the age of menopause. So it looks like the hormones are in fact doing something and may well be a driver of many, many health issues. So to tackle postmenopausal estrogens, you wanna trim body fat. We already talked about that, but it uh, it's real. BMI is strongly associated with postmenopausal breast cancer. Uh, you want to avoid dairy, obviously. Um, and an Australian study here done in 2010 looked at women who avoided dairy compared to those who consumed dairy and estradiol levels noticeably lower in the dairy avoiders. That's the green bar. Okay. So thirdly, a low fat, high fiber diet. Very, very easy to put to work. And the last thing I just want to touch on briefly is breast cancer survival. The Women's Intervention Nutrition Study brought in about 2,000 women, and they were all postmenopausal. They all had had breast cancer, and they just reduced the fat in their diet. And what did they find? The risk of recurrence was 24% lower in the diet intervention group. And, and by the way, it was also true for whether they were estrogen receptor negative or positive. So cutting fat reduces cancer recurrence. The Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study looked at not cutting fat, but increasing vegetables and fruits. Some of the women were asked to eat five a day. Some of them were asked to eat eight a day. A lot of vegetables, lots of fruits. Uh, didn't really make a big difference if you were in the five a day or eight a day group. However, it did matter what you actually did. And this is within the comparison group. Those who ate their vegetables and fruits, a lot of them, 7.6 servings a day, and were physically active, had a 4.8% mortality in the follow-up period. Those who neglected their vegetables and fruits, and, but were physically active, had double the mortality. Those who ate their vegetables and fruits, but they were couch potatoes, had a high mortality. And those who neglected their vegetables and fruits, when I say neglected, I mean only three servings a day. That's hardly neglect, but it's lower than the, than the high servings that, were, that we wanted. Uh, and were physically inactive, have the highest mortality. So the, the question is, do I reduce fat or do I increase vegetables and fruits and exercise? The answer is do it all. Okay, uh, breast cancer mortality increases with dairy consumption. This is a 2013 study. Those women consuming the most high fat dairy had a 49% higher risk of dying of their cancer compared to women generally avoiding it. Uh, a couple words about soy products. You will hear patients say, doesn't soy cause cancer? What they're thinking is that the uh, isoflavones like genistein in soy might have an action like estradiol. However, in 2004, a meta-analysis of eight studies showed that high soy intake was associated with lower risk of breast cancer, about a 29% lower. And those women who have had cancer in the past who consume the most soy have, again, about a 30% reduction in the likelihood of dying of their cancer. So let me be clear. Soy does not increase cancer risk or cancer, or cancer mortality. It does the reverse. Women who have gotten the well-meaning but ill-advised advice to avoid soy 
don't do well at all. Soy seems to be fine. It's not essential, but it doesn't increase cancer risk. And so the American Cancer Society has guidelines on diet and physical activity. These came out earlier this year. And what they say is just what you would hope. Get physically active, follow a healthy diet, avoid alcohol. What does this mean? A healthy diet means foods that are high in nutrients that help achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. Vegetables, legumes, fruits. Okay, healthy foods, whole grains. All right, uh, all vegan foods, aren't they? So to make it sweet, they say, especially get away from red and processed meats, sugar sweetened beverages and junk food. Very good. The Let's Beat Breast Cancer Campaign is coming back uh, next month. And let me encourage you to uh, let all your patients know about plant-based diets, regular physical activity, uh, alcohol should not be a recreational beverage and uh, tackle your body weight. Okay, so a healthy uh, diet is fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. Don't forget your vitamin B12. You need it for healthy nerves, healthy blood. Any supplement of vitamin B12 will do, but you don't want to neglect it. Uh, to start a healthy diet, the way we introduce it to patients is breaking it into two steps, and I've never seen anyone unable to do it. Step one is you say to the patient, take seven days to just think about the foods you'd eat. Take a piece of paper and take this paper and over the next seven days, fill out breakfasts and lunches and dinners and snacks that happen to be vegan, no animal products, but that you would like. Give them some suggestions. Uh, oatmeal, bran flakes with almond milk. During the week, if you never tasted almond milk, your job is to taste it. And then for lunches, try a pizza without the cheese, try the bean burrito, try the veggie burger, whatever the case may be. And the patients discover that at restaurants, they can get spaghetti with tomato sauce or a bean burrito or veggie fajitas. They can get rice and vegetable dishes and tofu dishes. And even the sushi bar is happy to give them a cucumber roll, an asparagus roll, a sweet potato roll. And fast food, not the pinnacle of culinary art, but if that's where your patients eat, then their job is to figure out what's vegan there. And after seven days, they'll come back and see. And their list will be all filled out. So that was step one, seven days to figure out the foods that you'd like. And, and now we're gonna actually eat those foods. For the next three weeks, do a test drive, all vegan, all the time for 21 days. At the end of that time, two things will have happened. The patients will physically have changed, their blood sugar is coming down, they're, they're losing weight, they're feeling better, but their tastes are changing and they're embracing a healthy diet. Uh, if you would like to do this yourself, or refer patients to it. The, uh, Dr. Graff has a wonderful uh, program coming up. And let me invite Dr. Graff to, to tell you about it. It's called Four Leaf 101. Dr. Graff? Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Barner. Sure. Um, so I've been running this class, Four Leaf 101. Oops. Uh, I've been starting my, uh, running this class uh, for about the last five years. This is the first one we're going to be doing online via Zoom. Um, but basically, I walk people through adopting a whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet over the course of five weeks. So the first week is really just an introduction to why they might want to do it. And then we actually do it one meal at a time. We'll do breakfast first, and then uh, we always talk about protein at that one, get some, answer any questions regarding that. And then we keep going with the breakfast, and we add in lunches uh, and talk more about calcium and some other concerns people have. Uh, the third week, uh, well, it's actually the fourth week, we add on dinner plans, and then the last week, uh, we talk about troubleshooting, how to make this work when you're out to dinner, and how to make it work when you're um, at a family gathering, those kind of things. Um, so it's uh, lots of fun when we do it together because we get to share food, and uh, the last class, everybody brings in something they learned how to make, but we're limited at this time with COVID, uh, but we're running this on online. So we would love for any uh, of you to join us if you would like to transition to this diet yourself and you'd like a little help to do it. Uh, some people really jump in and do a great job and they don't really need a class. Other people need a lot of hand holding as they're making this adjustment. Uh, you know, for me, when I went to eating this way, the first week I, I did it kind of overnight because I had uh, numbers that were put me very close to being in diabetic land. I had a postprandial sugar of 197 and that got my attention. So I did it overnight, but that first week, all I ate was brown rice and veggies for dinner because I couldn't think of anything else to make, right? So uh, a lot of us learn how to cook by uh, what's the meat? How do you cook it? What do you put on the sides? And when you take the meat off of it, you're like, okay, what do I eat? Sides? I don't know. 
So um, for some people really need a lot of help when they're, when they're going through it. So some like Dr. Barnard uh, said, you know, they really kind of adopt this easily and other people, you know, really need some hand holding. So uh, we, we are running this class and you can register by calling my office or emailing and you're certainly welcome to send any patients uh, our way as well for the class or for consults. So if you want, uh, we do individual consults with patients um, uh, here at my office. And we also have Dr. Natasha Sodi joining us and she's doing telehealth consultations for us for lifestyle medicine. And uh, in Care Connect, it's ambulatory referral lifestyle medicine with a drop down list and you'll see our names. So I'm the only one doing it in person currently. Um, Dr. Petrusco uh, had been doing them in person as well, but she's out on maternity leave for the next couple of months. So. Um, Dr. Uh, Sodi as well doing it uh, via telehealth. So we'd love to have you join us um, and we'd love to have you send the patients to us as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Graver. Before I give you the microphone back uh, for good, I just wanted to mention a couple of other things. Um, here is a free app called uh, the 21 Day Vegan Kickstart. It's free and non-commercial, but it includes menus and recipes and cooking videos that patients can use. Um, we also have a another free app called the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians. It's 90 chapters, everything from Alzheimer's to varicose veins about the role of nutrition. Again, free and non-commercial. It's not sponsored by a drug company or anybody else. A nutrition Guide for Clinicians, it's on your iPhone or your Android. A nutrition CME, if you want uh, some CME credits to renew your license this year, uh, go to nutritioncme.org. It is all free and it's all nutrition related. So that's all I've got. I'll unshare my screen. Thank you so much to all of you for not only for caring for patients as you do, but for your attention today. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnard. That was a wonderful presentation. We've got a number of questions for you. Sure. Um, the first one has to do with uh, reports about, uh, are there any studies on peripheral circulation and neuropathy uh, with folks that have, uh, that make this diet change? Uh, there, uh, our team was struck by anecdotal reports that neuropathy improved. So we did a randomized trial on this, oh, maybe six or eight years ago. We brought in people with late stage type two diabetes um, and they all had painful neuropathy. As you know, late neuropathy can be um, in some cases numbness, but in some cases uh, stabbing pains or temperature changes or tremendous uh, sensitivity. Uh, these patients will lie in bed and if the sheets touch their feet, it, it, it hurts them. And we found that, it, that indeed uh, neuropathy improves with a low fat plant-based diet. There is also uh, evidence that exercise will help. So for any neuropathy patient, we would encourage them to do both. Um, in addition to whatever medications they're taking, get it to be a completely vegan diet, very low in fat, and also uh, get them exercising to the extent they're able to do it. Uh, everybody's different. Um, in some cases, their neuropathy will, will remit. In other cases, it may not, and there are some people in between the two. Okay. Um, I had somebody make the comment about diabetes can go away. Do you agree when people have bariatric surgery and A1C normalizes, the diabetes also goes away? I'd call it remission, like we do with psychiatric aids. Um, you can use any word that you want. It just really depends on what definitions you're using. Um, most people would say if, you're, if your A1C is in the normal range and you're not on medication, that the, the diabetes isn't there. Um, but back when we started this work, oh, you know, 20 years ago, people would get really upset if you would say that, um, the, if you would say anything other than, once you're diabetic, you'll always be diabetic. And, and that was kind of a good reason. You could understand why people would, would tell patients that because they wanted patients to, to not fool around with it. Um, you know, di diabetes can make you blind. It can, it can lead to amputations. And so they wanted patients to take it seriously and to take their medications and to do their testing. And they would say, once you're diabetic, you'll always be diabetic. But then we ran into problems because the diabetes, diabetes definition just didn't fit for a lot of patients if they made changes that were strong enough. And, and so um, I, I think people can, can freely use any definition they want to, but, and, and, there, and the word reversal is not a scientific term. It's just a generic term that means things that were bad are, are improving. So you can define it in any way that you'd like. Yeah, I usually say that, you know, tell people their diabetes is in remission. And if they continue on the diet, that should help keep you in remission. Sometimes if you say your diabetes is gone, they kind of think they're gonna just go back to what they're gonna do because their diabetes, you know, don't have to do anything anymore. Yes, and, and as I said earlier, diabetes can come back really easily. It's, it's like hypertension. If, you know, if your blood pressure is 110 over 55, you don't have hypertension. You can say it's gone, you can say it's in remission, whatever you want to, but all you have to do is eat a whole bunch of fatty, high salt foods, get sedentary and gain a lot of weight, and you can get hypertension again. 
So there are, um, is it a trait, is it a state? I would tend to think of it as a, a state, but, but people can take it in whichever way they like. We had a question in regards to dairy consumption and uh, basically a dairy-free diet on bone health and calcium metabolism. Could you speak to that? Yeah, it's imp uh, important to remember in, in Western cultures, people think of calcium as coming from milk and if the milk products aren't there, what do we do? Uh, it's important to remember that cows do not make elements. A cow can't make iodine, they can't make calcium, they can't make iron. Um, these are elements. And the only reason there's calcium in milk is because there's calcium in the earth. And it goes through the roots of grass into the blades of grass and the cow eats the grass. And then some of that calcium gets absorbed into their body and, and you'll, you will absorb about 32% of the calcium that's in the cow's milk. What nature thought you were gonna do was to have green vegetables yourself, and hopefully not grass, but broccoli or kale or collards or Brussels sprouts or whatever, they all have calcium. Um, and there are a few uh, exceptions, a spinach or chard, they're quite high in calcium, but their absorption is quite low. But for kale and collards and um, broccoli and Brussels sprouts, uh, most green vegetables, the, the calcium absorption is, is quite high. Um, and so it's good to really include lots of these in your diet. A uh, question about minimal time a person needs to be on a plant-based diet to show effect. I'm sorry, say that again. I, I, uh, is there minimal time a person needs to be on a plant-based uh, diet to show effect? Yeah, about a day. <laughs> it, it, it depends. Everybody, everybody's different. Um, there have been, um, I will never forget, there was a, a woman uh, I was speaking with had chronic constipation starting in childhood, and it lasted until she was 42. She had had all kinds of workups. And she finally stopped dairy. And within a day, everything got back to normal. Um, with regard to blood sugars, um, it's, it's quite variable. With some people, their blood sugars will start dropping within three, four days. With others, others it might take a couple of weeks. But I would strongly caution you, um, when you're using a plant-based diet, a vegan diet that's low in fat, this is not your mother's diabetes, diabetes diet. This is powerful. So if patients are treated with insulin or sulfonylureas, they will very often become hypoglycemic if you don't also back them down on their medications. Now, they're going to be thrilled. I was on 20 units of Lantus, and now I'm only on 16, and the week after that, I'm only on 12, and you know, you're backing them down. But keep up with them, because this is a powerful diet. It makes them insulin sensitive again, and so they no longer need the doses they needed before. And you don't, you don't want to leave them hypoglycemic all the time. That's, that's dangerous. So make sure they know how to contact you, make sure they got a meter, make sure they know how to take glucose tablets or whatever it is if they get hypoglycemic and keep ahead of them so that their blood sugars can fall safely. Wonderful. Yeah, that's definitely what I found in practice as well is uh, you get, if you get people that make this change suddenly, you need to back them off very, very fast. You can, you can drop 50 units of insulin in the first week. So. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and patients are thrilled with that, obviously. But, um, but you do keep up with them. And, and with regard to weight, I would say an average is about maybe a pound of weight loss per week, depending on the person. Some lose faster, some slower. But if a patient's losing a quarter of a pound a week, fair enough. Um, if it's going in the right direction, there's 52 weeks in a year, you do the math, people lose weight. Yeah, you were talking about the mechanism for diabetes being the intermire cellular lipid, but that takes a while to go away. So why do you get such a quick effect really within a day or two uh, when you cut out the fat in the diet and you increase the carbohydrates, there must be something kind of external that's also at play. We are still looking at these things. Um, I, I, I do think that the changes in intramyocellular lipid and hepatocellular lipid, little changes can have big effects very rapidly. Uh, but, but there's more to it. Uh, keep in mind that the diet that we're eating is high in fiber. So even though the patients will swear they are not restricting their eating as much as they want to, the truth is they're probably eating a couple hundred calories less each day. And so they're, they're, they're losing weight. Uh, there's less lipid going into the system. Um, and also if their foods are lower glycemic index, uh, the presentation of glucose into the body reduces too. So all these things work at the same time and they, they all are, are part of the improvement. There was a question about uh, safety data when it comes to expecting and breastfeeding women about eating a low fat vegan diet. I mean, is it safe for a yes. woman who's pregnant to follow a vegan diet? Yeah, that was the question. Uh, okay, that's a great question, but I would turn it around. Is it safe for a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman to, to be eating anything other than a plant-based diet? Um, I have to say there was, there was a, 
research study by Michael Skilton's group in Australia. It came out, I think, about two or three years ago, where he looked at women um, who had gained weight during pregnancy. As, uh, I mean, every woman gains weight during pregnancy, but those who gained more versus gained less. And some women were obese uh, during their pregnancy, of course. When the children are born, through ultrasound, you can non-invasively measure their aortic walls. And the, the more obese the women were, the more arterial thickening was evident in the children at birth. Meaning, the diseases of a high fat, high cholesterol, fiber depleted diet don't start when you're 52. They start probably in utero and in childhood. And um, don't get me wrong, you do wanna plan, um, but a plant-based diet is, is much more nutritious than a meat-based diet. And by, by that I mean, you're eating fruits, you're eating vegetables, so you're getting lots of vitamins and minerals. But planning means the four groups, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, do take your prenatal vitamins. Um, you need vitamin B12, uh, folate supplementation. There's a rationale for all of these things. And that's also true when you're breastfeeding. So um, have a, a healthy, well-planned diet. Uh, the American Di Dietetic Association has weighed on this, or I'm sorry, it's now called the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, has weighed in very strongly on this, that it's healthy for every stage of life and has health advantages. There are a number of other questions, but we are really over time, so I'm gonna just end with one more, uh, which comes up, patients are asking about this one all the time. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting in addition to doing a plant-based vegan diet? I, I think it's fine. I, I think it's, you, you'll typically hear a five on, two off kind of thing where people are eating for five days and fasting more or less for a couple of days. Um, it's fine if you want to do it, but I have a couple of cautions. First of all, remember that if you're on a vegan diet, you're on a healthy diet. So it's not as if you need to fast to make up for dietary sins that you had during the week. And if the upcoming fast means that you're gonna pig out during those five days, it's gonna do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there is a literature on fasting and some people will use water fasting, for example, to cool down inflammatory syndromes. I'm quite prepared to believe that it works, but it's dangerous. If a person does a water fast for even a few weeks without medical supervision, you're gonna get into trouble. So if you're gonna do that, go to a place where you will be monitored medically like uh, uh, True North, for example, in Santa Rosa, California. They're, they're gonna watch you, a doctor will see you every single day doing your fast. Be careful with these things. Um, so yeah, fasting can be okay if you do it carefully. All right, well, we're gonna wrap things up since we're a bit over time. Dr. Neil Barnard, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, this has just been a treasure trove of wonderful information. Um, and we hope to have you back uh, in the future. Thank I you so much. I look forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Graft, and thanks to all the attendees today. Okay. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe out there. Wear your mask.